All right. So today we continue with our uh, lectures on uh, contact aware control. Last time, you remember, we uh, discussed inverse uh, dynamics, right? We went through a few lectures which uh, discussed mod uh, model stuff. Uh, in particular, we discussed uh, the models uh, that come from second order dynamic, from manipulate equation, and then we saw projectors, all right? So both of those have to do with dynamics, how it is represented from, uh, you can say Lagrange equations, which are transformed into manipulate equations. And, uh, then you further massage them into becoming uh, equations in the form of projected uh, equations. So we explicitly write out a projector. And that allowed us to quite easily solve inverse dynamics. Okay, so that was our path so far. We did not speak uh, yet about uh, stabilizing control. In this lecture, we will. But uh, to get there, we'll start with question of linearization. All right, so let's uh, go right in. So first of all, before we can begin talking about linearization, let's talk about linear models uh, with explicit constraints. Linear models with explicit constraints. Uh, it is not completely obvious, so we have to spend just a few minutes uh, talking about it. So LTI, linear time invariant system, with explicit constraints, I'll denote it as uh, ECLTI. It can be rewritten in this fashion. So let's understand what it is. So here is classical LTI, x dot equals to ax plus bu. Okay, that's so classical LTI. Plus reaction forces times reaction uh, Jacob, uh, constraint Jacobian, you can say. Reaction forces, reaction force Jacobian F. And separately constrained equation here, g times x dot equals to zero. It's a constrained equation. So overall, the equation is quite simple, right? Classical t plus two additions, reaction force, constrained equation. Very similar to what we saw before when we considered the manipulated equation. Manipulated equation. Here we had classical manipulator equation, and here we had exact same thing, right? So reaction force and constraint equation. Okay. So same stuff here. Oh. So this is the explicit model. Now, let us see how we can uh, massage it into a form where we wouldn't have uh, as many variables, you could say. Like, we'll simplify it. So let's uh, see it step by step. First, we can get uh, substitute this equation. Remember, this is the first equation. Into here, this is the second equation. So basically, we can get this expression for x dot, substitute here. What we get as a result is g times ax plus bu plus f lambda. All right, this is what we get. Now, we can, from this expression, express out this GFL, GFL, so this is fx times g, right? GF lambda. It will be on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we will have everything else. So ax plus b multiply again by g, 
just with a minus sign. So you see the steps so far are quite simple, right? Substitute. That's how we get here. Express. Okay. Next, we express lambda by uh, inverting this part. So this guy, we invert it. So this remains the same, right? This remains the same. Minus sign is from here. We just invert GF. Uh, it has to be, it doesn't have to be invertible. It, at the very least, has to con like it's, um, how should we put it? This vector here should, at the very least, be uh, in the column space of this matrix. That's what uh, has at the very least to uh, has to be. So if this vector here is not contained in the uh, column space of this matrix, it means that there exists no such lambda that uh, this equation holds. And this equation, so basically we have a, we have a big problem. Okay. Now, uh, if there exists such lambda, then everything is fine. We can uh, invert it like this. If there exist many such lambdas, let's say instead of one solution, we have a null space of solutions. Like we have a particular solution, but also a whole null space of possible solutions. That is perfectly fine. Uh, there is no issue with that. We saw it already when we discussed projectors, you remember? When we was uh, saying that if if uh, we have you know uh, multiple solutions for lambda, we could always uh, change make a change of variables, which would lead to different f different uh, instead of lambda we would have something else gamma, and fine no problem we would have a new variable but uh, the equation would be the same. It's just that the physical meaning of the reaction forces will be different, right? right? No problem. Okay. So uh, same here. If uh, we have, if this matrix is not invertible, but uh, this least square problem for can be solved with zero residual then everything is fine. And uh, as I said before, for it to be solved with zero residual, this vector here has to lie in the column space of this matrix here. That's, uh, that is the, what we need to uh, keep in mind. OK. Uh, if some of it is like not completely clear, please pause me, uh, like tell me to repeat. I will happily repeat and we'll go over it again. All right. Now, uh, next step here. We take this whole expression here and we substitute it back here. Okay. So we take this expression, substitute it here. What we get is this part. F plus F, right? Here's F. And plus this whole expression that we substitute. So the expression that we substitute is GF, so the inverse, G, AX plus BU. Uh, U is uh, apparently lost here. Okay. Minus sign is again from substitution. So this whole expression is being substituted. Zoom tells me my internet connection is better right now. So uh, I'll try to speak slowly until it gets better. Usually it uh, goes uh, better in like under one minute. 
So I'll just try to make sure we don't go fast during the mint. You probably have a jumbled sound. Okay. If uh, if it goes bad for longer, we would have as a recording. But okay, hopefully the connection is is back. Generally, we have no problem with connection. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Uh, because I cannot hear on my side how you see me, right? I don't have a feedback through the internet, right? So I have to assume that you, uh, at, at the very least, have like a don't hear me very well, right? That's usually what happens. Uh, so I'm trying to at least be slow. If I'm slow, you can usually catch me. Okay. All right. So next step. So this you understand. This was just substitution into this equation of this guy. Nice. Next step. We have uh, here two exact, uh, two copies of the exact same stuff. AX plus BU. And here AX plus BU. Sorry, it is, U is not printed here, but it is there. Now, what can we do here? Well, we can get this out of the brackets. So we have this thing here. Right? And um, what do we have in the brackets? We have identity here minus this guy here. Well, that's it. That's a quite easy step. So we just take stuff out of the brackets. We get uh, what we get. Okay. Now let us. Uh, that's all. That is the whole derivation that we need to get through. Five steps, but uh, not very difficult. But uh, we have to kind of see them. Let's uh, now just spend a minute looking at it. So we have x times this matrix, this big matrix. And uh, so x is equal to this big matrix times ax plus b. Okay. That's what we got. Nice. Great. Uh, reminds you about what we had before, right? When we have projector matrix times manipulate equation. Here we have this big thing that looks like a projector matrix times uh, the LTI equation. Okay. Now, if we define AC as this big projector looking matrix times A, and we define BC as, again, this big projector looking matrix times B, then what we obtain is the new system, which would be x dot equals to acx plus bcu. Okay. So we have new system, which we got just by defining new variables. This system, please notice, I keep g x dot equals to zero here, but it doesn't have reaction forces. There are no reaction forces here. So there, are, there is a constraint equation, no reaction forces. Okay, because the reaction forces were expressed out during uh, this step. This is the expression that we substituted, and then this step, say, were expressed out in the step five. Oh. Good. So this uh, expression, uh, equation seven, is the final result of this whole process. And uh, I refer to this process as linear fractional transformation because it uh, reminds me of linear fractional transformation as presented uh, in a textbook by Amato, where uh, almost exactly the same process is being used uh, to transform systems with um, um, parameter uncertainty in, in from, let's say, like explicit form like this to implicit form like this, OK? So exact same for process, roughly speaking, I'd say, is used there. So that's why I use uh, the linear fraction transformation to describe this. Term. OK? I'm not sure if there is a 
more precise mathematical terminology for this. But I, that, that is uh, how I usually refer to it. This process, uh, you know, same as a lot of stuff that we described here, uh, you maybe will be able to find it somewhere in the literature. I'm not even sure. Most likely you would maybe be able to find maybe final result, maybe in one paper somewhere. I don't know. But uh, it's uh, uh, terminology for this kind of stuff is not uh, easy to find. So uh, I try to just use the term uh, terminology that is close to uh, look to me uh, appropriate. Okay. Well, but yeah, the important idea is just the derivation. That's that is quite straightforward, I think. Okay, so this is what we got. Now, uh, let's analyze this a little bit. So this ex this ex uh, equation here is what we would call system with implicit um, constraints. Okay, so I'd say if previous was explicitly constrained LTI, this is implicitly constrained LTI. Okay, implicitly constrained LTI. I see LTI. Why implicitly? Well, because essentially, if you only consider the first equation, you cannot tell that there are constraints. They're still there. Constraints are still here. You just cannot tell that they're here. They're hidden. So that's why implicitly constrained. By all this process of um, transformations, we got rid of as explicit form. Uh, the process is almost exactly the same as what we used when we did projector stuff uh, two lectures ago. Um, uh, is uh, or when we were expressing accelerations, right? I think maybe even three lectures ago. So the steps are almost exactly the same. And uh, it kind of like buries the uh, reaction equations, hides them away, and constraint equations kind of become unnecessary, you could say. In fact, if you only consider this ex equation here, okay, if you only consider this equation here, it already describes dynamics perfectly. So the equation here you don't need. You can get rid of this constraint equation. Why? Well, because the first equation already contains information that you would need to solve the system. Right? The constraint equation does not contain information which is not already in here. Okay. Uh, th this happens because we used both of them to produce it uh, to produce this first equation. So in fact, what happens is this equation would be in some sort, in some way, degenerate, degenerate in such a way that x, so uh, you know, rate of change of x, would al already satisfy this constraint equation. So x here does not need reaction forces, it will naturally satisfy constraint equation just because this first equation is degenerate in this way. This uh, first equation lies, uh, describes x dot lying on a manifold. So it doesn't lie in Rn space, it lies on the manifold. And the manifold is described by this equation, g x dot equals to zero. So in fact, uh, this manifold in this case is linear space. It is a null space of G. And the x dot would lie on, in this null space. So without us doing anything, uh, applying any reaction forces, this x dot would already be in this linear space. Right? It would stay there. No matter which U we apply, it will always be satisfying this equation. So that is an uh, interesting effect here. So it's important to keep in mind. When you have this ICLTI, uh, so implicit form, the constraint equation will always be satisfied without anything 
added here, right? Without uh, reaction forces. And this implies that the equation itself is degenerate. Right? So uh, this multiplication factor that already is absorbed in AC and BC um, acts similar as a projector. If you want to prove that it is a projector, you have to basically just uh, decide which properties of a projector you want to prove that my, this matrix has, and you can try to prove it. Uh, here I don't provide this, but uh, if you're interested in if you can call it a projector, you know, you can look up which properties of a projector you want it to have. I mean, there are various types of projectors, right? So there's orthogonal projectors, there's just regular projectors. There are ways to, to, discuss, to discuss this. And you can try to see what you want to prove, and you can try to prove it. Okay. okay. So what are the consequences of uh, what we just said? What is the consequence of the fact that this equation is degenerate and uh, this equation is always satisfied implicitly? Well, one consequence is that uh, this system, this LTI system, you cannot uh, solve a uh, control problem for it. Like, for example, stabilizing control. Let's say I want uh, asymptotically stable control design for the system. Okay, So I take the system x dot equals to ACX plus BCU, and I want to solve a stabilizing control. Well, it is impossible by definition. <laughs> Why? Because stabilizing control, like uh, uh, asymptotically, that provides, uh, provides asymptotic stability, would uh, require that closed loop system, after we, uh, you know, we generate like linear control law for U, which would be substituted in, into the system, and we have like A minus BK matrix. Okay. Well, this matrix would have to be have negative. Uh, eigenvalues, like it has to be Hurwitz, as we say, right? So let me just write it quick. AC minus BC. Okay. This matrix would have to be Hurwitz. Like for uh, uh, Hurwitz means eigenvalues have negative real parts. Oh, hope I don't uh, misspell the name. Right, so uh, it has to be Hurwitz, but it is impossible. Why? Well, because if it was Hurwitz, it would mean that uh, a state which initially started um, here, um, like somewhere in this null space, would move along this null space towards zero. But by, by, by the very definition, this is the direction in which x dot cannot move. X dot cannot have a, any motion in the null space. In the null space, x dot has to be zero. So if x start, starts somewhere in the null space of g, it can't move, it has to stay there. So, and we said that this equation satisfies this constraint implicitly. So it means that when you design stabilizing control law for this equation, what you would hear is that the equation is not, the system is not controllable. It's not controllable. That's what you would find. Your LQR will tell you that uh, Riccati equation cannot be solved. Pole placement will tell you that it has failed to place one of the poles. Your controllability test will tell you that uh, the controllability matrix is not a correct rank, and so on and so forth. So you would see problems. OK, well, just uh, <laughs> I can predict you those problems without uh, looking at a particular system. It's just the property of what we created. OK. Uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, it is stabilizable. So if you had a course on uh, uh, nonlinear control, I think, uh, the, especially the course offered by Simeon, he would probably teach you about stabilizability as opposed to controllability. So the idea is that you your non-controllable states are somehow stable. And uh, there, yeah, they don't grow at least, right? There it would be okay. Like you can produce control that stabilizes your system in terms of like your system is stabilizable, right? So you can, can produce control uh, such that 
the states that you can control are symptomatically stable. The other ones are Lepunov stable. Okay. But that is a detail. And the important fact is if you just plug it into a QR or poll placement, the system will tell you you cannot do anything about it. Right? Okay. So uh, sorry, we belabored this point uh, for quite a while. Just wanted to make sure that we understand that this is a looks like LTI system has strange properties that will prevent you from being able to treat it as one. Like you cannot just do linear control on the system without thinking because your all your commands will uh, give you errors. Like LQR will give you errors. Uh, controllability test will give you negative result. Poll placement will give you error. Okay, that's my idea, like general ideas that you want to build. Okay, okay, wonderful. Like this is uh, where we are. Uh, and uh, this is uh, linear systems. Now, how do we get them? How do we get them? Before we can answer the question of how to control them, which is a very nice question and we will answer it at the end of the lecture. Let us first answer a uh, simple question. How do we get them? Where do we find them in the wild? Okay, so let's uh, try to find out. Well, we, as most, <laughs> as, us as usual, I guess, we find them by linearization, okay? So uh, usually linear systems, we, sometimes they are natural systems that are linear, that occur, like a motor is a linear system, uh, spring mass temper is a linear system. There are a few others, okay? Uh, but uh, typically in robotics, we have to linearize to get a linear system, okay? So linear models, they don't occur very often. And uh, most of the models that we find are by linearization, okay? Which is uh, perfectly fine. It is extremely useful. Uh, we, people use linearized models in aerodynamics, in like in controlling of aircraft. Uh, in uh, various uh, controls of nonlinear robots, such as you know inverted pendulum, a famous case where you can use linearization, and so on. So please don't think of linearization here as giving up, so, <laughs> or as like just some not very interesting case. It is interesting case. It is extremely important. So, um, how do we uh, linearize? Well, linearization, um, I think we usually use uh, the word linearization, but what we actually do is tailor expansion, okay? Uh, I think this is maybe quite important, uh, quite important uh, term to keep in mind. Maybe we don't use the word enough in education, okay? Tailor expansion. Uh, linearization by itself refers to the process of finding such model linear model that describes dynamics locally at a point the best way possible. Okay. So there are all kinds of simplified models that you can propose. You can propose many models that are similar to the original one, but simpler in some case, in some sense. Okay, no problem. There are many linear models that would act as a simplified model of your system. Okay, no problem. There is only one model which describes your system as best as you can locally, which is linear. And that would be a linearized model, right? So linearization refers to this particular, uh, finding this particular type. And this is done by taking the first term of Taylor expansion, right? Well, that is the situation. So just to give an example, if we have our dynamics looking like this, right? Uh, linearization would look you know, like that at this point. But you can totally uh, tell me that uh, you would prefer maybe you would prefer maybe like this type of model because you want, you know, 
you want a different slope. You want uh, it to cover like peak to peak maybe linear regression. You want it to uh, you you want to build your linearized model based on like a wider window or something. Fine, like, why not? But linearization, like the process of linearization, finding the uh, best local approximation, refers to finding this particular one, the green one. Like you can propose other methods of linearizing, but there is only one that refers to the best possible approximation locally. Okay. Uh, there is a difference between those, uh, those things. Okay. So linearization is a tail expansion. Uh, tail expansion of what? Okay. We have uh, like first uh, question uh, clear. Okay. Linearization refers to the taking first term of Taylor expansion. Next question: Taylor expansion of what? Uh, oh, of your uh, dynamics, which describe your uh, the behavior of your uh, derivatives. Okay, higher order derivatives. So in our case, we are interested in this uh, description. Q double dot equals to f of q q dot u. Okay, so this is this describes our second order dynamics. We want to take its Taylor expansion. Okay, but now uh, let us remember what it is. Well, what it is is this um, projector times this regular inverse dynamics of the manipulator equation. Plus this pseudo inverse times this particular solution or uh, constraint equation. And the pseudo inverse itself is actually this whole huge guy, which, as we discussed, is a weighted inverse of J of the Jacobian, constraint Jacobian. With the, where the weight is uh, the inertia matrix, generalized inertia matrix. So uh, let's just remind you what it is. So what we have here is just the expression for Q double dot. And you can see it as a huge expression. It's not a, it's not an easy one. Okay, big guy. This is a big guy. This is not going to be easy to tailor expand. Okay. Now let's just uh, walk through the tail expansion in the abstract, you know, like on the abstract level. So what is the tail expansion here? Well, it would be first order term, so zero order term. Sorry. So this is done by evaluating f at the point of expansion. So point of expansion is q q dot u u uh, u at the point zero, some uh, some point of expansion. Next is linear term. So linear term is, is that okay? This is the Jacobian of f with respect to q. And this guy, Jacobian of f with respect to q dot. Okay. And this guy, Jacobian of f with respect to u. So we have three variables. So we would have three linear terms. So the system uh, uh, varies linearly with respect to each of them. Okay. Now each linear term uh, has a um, something in front. And here it is like q minus q zero. Here is, it is q dot minus q zero dot. Here is u minus u zero. Mm -hmm. And then you have higher order terms. It would include quadratic terms if we wanted to. So it would be uh, the quadratic terms. So it would be second derivatives, like Hessians, what we call. This is Jacobians. Those blue ones are Jacobians. Next, uh, we'd have Hessians. It will be df dq squared, or it will be df dq dq dot, df dq du, and so on. Mixed derivatives. All of this would be there. And the uh, third order terms, fourth order terms, uh, to infinite, right? Okay. As 
we are only interested in uh, this kind of data. Okay. Here, uh, intellectually, you, ha you have two roads. Two roads. Uh, they, are, they are both mm, fine. Uh, I'll just point out two roads you can show intellectually. Okay. So mathematically, there is just one road, but intellectually, you have two. Uh, one road is to try to look into this part, this whole equation, and rewrite it carefully and uh, diligently as uh, something that you will get. It will be a linear equation. After you write it out, you will have a linear equation, so there will be no problem. Uh, but uh, while writing, you would have to deal with this component, this times this, and this times this, and this times this, right? So all of those components you can see uh, will produce quite a bit of a mess, okay? Quite a bit of a mess. But uh, it's perfectly reasonable to write it all. So, like, you, there won't be any mathematical issues here, okay? Uh, second, uh, uh, it will work out, so no problem. Second option is instead of thinking about this, you can think of variations. So you can say, what is a variation of u double dot? So instead of thinking about q double dot, you'll say, what is a variation of q double dot? And the variation of q double dot would be this times variation of q dot, this time, uh, sorry, of q, this times variation of q, do, uh, q dot, and this times variation of u. And then you say, okay, those variations, those Jacobians are what produce linear model. Okay, perfectly fine again. Uh, both of those ways are compatible. They just like they're talking about the same thing, but in different terminology. Like if you write out what variation means, you can say this like q double dot minus q double dot zero, and everything will be fine, right? Like basically it will be like this difference is a variation of q. When if you if q approaches q dot, so if you approach q zero. Etc. Like those become variations. This guy and this guy would produce a variation on the left hand side. So it's the same stuff in both cases. But uh, in the first case, if you follow Taylor expansion, you don't have to bring in yet another piece of mathematics like calculus of variations. It just looks, you know, fine. You just have to deal with f of zero and all of those other terms. If you bring in calculus of variations, uh, what you get is just much simpler uh, expression. You basically just have variation here plus this times variation, plus this times variation, plus this times variation. Okay, it's just simpler. But uh, you would have to always double double question yourself if you didn't uh, make a mistake somewhere, right? because you, 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 unless you are very familiar with what you're doing, you can't make it. Okay, so um, in practice, what people often do, I think, is uh, they just look at this and say, okay, we have a Jacobian, Jacobian, Jacobian. We don't care about like how, where those Jacobian comes, come from. We understand that we can get them from Taylor expansion or from variations. People say, we don't care. We just have three Jacobians. Fair enough. That would be true in any case. Okay, good. And those Jacobians, we can uh, define them. So this Jacobian, we'll call it AQ. This Jacobian, we'll call it AV. And this Jacobian, we'll call it B. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we introduce a new variable, uh, X, which is a state variable. It will have Q, Q dot as components. And we can write now a linear, linearized equation. Linearized equation would look like this. Q dot, or sorry, X dot, equal to this huge matrix times S plus this matrix times U plus U. Okay, let's uh, see where we get this matrix. Well, uh, X dot has a component Q dot, Q double dot, right? Because this x dot, like x is q, q dot, x dot is q dot, q double dot, okay? Uh, q dot, 
So first component uh, it has to deal with this row. So Q dot is equal to this row times X plus this times U. Well, this is clearly just zero. Zero times U is zero. So no, nothing here happens here. And here what we have is we say Q dot is equal to zero I times X. So zero times Q. Let me write it out, I guess, more clearly. So this will be zero times Q plus I times Q dot. And this has to be equal to Q dot. Again, why? Because X dot is Q dot Q dot. Okay, so the first equation is just Q dot equal Q dot. That's essentially what you have. And this is completely standard if you remember how linearization worked for any other um, system, mechanical system. So second of the system, when we deal with them, linearization always looks like this. It produces a block of zeros and identity. Okay, second row, so this row. It has to do with uh, Q double dot, right? So Q double dot. And uh, what Q double dot is equal to? Well, AQ times Q, right? And you see? This is, let me uh, color code one more time. So AQ, AQ times Q, right? That's what we have here. Plus AV times Q dot. Okay. Plus B times U. And here, notice I wrote uh, plus uh, constant. Plus constant. This constant would, in my case, include all of this, 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 and this. I didn't have to write it this way. I could have wrote it without this constant, uh, but I'm happy enough. Okay, so this is what we have. This is what we have. And uh, this is essentially exactly the same as what would have happened in the system without constraints. So nothing actually changed. Except one thing, except one thing. So previously, this Jacobian and this Jacobian and this Jacobian it was relatively easy to take them. I would argue that this Jacobian is still easy to take. This Jacobian is still easy to take. Why? Well, because if you look at F, F uh, U comes uh, linearly here. So taking derivative with respect to U would be quite simple. Okay. But taking derivative with respect to Q dot, for example, is not simple. Uh, well, uh, let's be careful. So Q dot comes here, comes here, right? So still, you could say that it is still simple enough. Okay. Fair enough. So the Jacobian with respect to Q dot is also simple. Now, Jacobian with respect to Q is extremely difficult because um, like this depends on Q and there is an inverse here. So it is already horrible. Uh, inverse of a uh, derivative of a inverted matrix is not a something you want to take lightly. Okay, like it is uh, possible to take as a derivative. So there is nothing too too scary about it, but it is not going to produce very nice expressions. Okay, uh, this depends on on uh, Q. So you have a product of two matrices. This all depends on Q again. Product of three matrices. Another inverse here. All of this is multiplied again by one of those things. There's another inverse here. This depends on Q. And sometimes this is depends on Q always, like this guy always depends on Q. And this expression here is actually quite involved. Like when the C happens to be one of those um, matrices, which is like, um, basically it already contains partial derivative of H. So it is like extra hard, okay? This C matrix. It looks innocent, but it is the worst. So, and this guy depends on Q. 
uh, of Perseus. Right. So uh, what we have is uh, just impossibly involved equation. In fact, it is so involved that I have not seen anyone doing it analytically. So I haven't seen people do it analytically. Like it is possible for simple systems to do it analytically. Okay. Uh, especially when you do some tricks and the tricks uh, have to do with uh, canceling some terms here. Okay. So there is some tricks that can be done by canceling some terms. Okay. Now, uh, uh, what people usually do is they just do it uh, by finite, finite differences. Whereas like normal linearization, people often do it analytically or with some close to analytical approaches. You have plenty of software that specializes in those things. I think the, what comes to me to mind is Pinocchio, famous software for linearization. I mean, for other things, of course, but also linearization. Here, this I think would mostly be done by only by finite differences. So if you want to tailor expand this guy, you have to do it by finite differences. So basically, you have a state variables, you move them aside a little bit, record q, q double dot, find difference. So this is one row. Do the same thing for uh, next uh, uh, component of q dot, that's another row, and so on until you exhaust everything. Okay. So you perturb each component of q, each component of q dot, each component of u, and you get your finite differences um this way. okay so this is how you do it numerically all right all right uh, this is a big difference so the difference is just that it is very hard to take the stereotype <laughs> i guess this may be a little bit of a uh, strange conclusion but uh, you know it is what it is okay okay so this is, uh, you know, what we saw. Essentially, this slide was just a repetition of what you saw if you studied any linearization. So this is not unique to constraint systems. The only unique part is that it is hard. Okay, that's a big part. All right. All right. Now, uh, uniqueness comes here. So it is not enough to have this equation here. We also have to have a constraint equation. So let me show you how constraint equation is done. So this equation, uh, remember, it is second order equation obtained by differentiating constraint twice, can be rewritten in terms of state variable x, wrote here, rewrite in terms of x dot, as this. Okay? So x dot is q dot, q double dot, okay? So x dot is q dot, q double dot. So q dot times this, uh, let, let me color code it better. So q dot, so it comes from this part here, is multiplying j dot here, right? Now, q double dot, this part here, is multiplying j here. So that's like second line in this equation. q dot also multiplies, q dot again here, also multiplies this j. So we have q dot times this j. And this is just the velocity equation, right? You remember this is just uh, g times dq dt equal to zero. This is just the first derivative of the constraints. So we have uh, our second derivative is here. Our first derivative is here. That's it. So uh, with that, we have this nice matrix g zero g dot g okay times x dot equal to zero 
So this matrix is actually quite typical. Um, not, not like what I want to say is that uh, you'll find it in the papers, and it's also just uh, naturally produced. Okay, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, completely kind of like accidental, not interesting detail. It is it is important uh, important matrix. Especially what is important here is that G you remember Constantin Chekhovin has properties. It is a wide matrix, so it would have null space. Uh, it would be, but it would be also full row rank. If it is not full row rank, it means constraints are linearly dependent. It means that uh, lambda would have would be a system with over constraint. Uh, lambda is not defined. Uh, it cannot be found exactly. So we could always change it, uh, change lambda for a different variable where we would have rank uh, uh, independent constraints. It, it would be what this matrix would have two row rank. So we can realistically expect it to be full row rank. At least, at least um, we can, uh, you know, we can transform it into full row rank, I guess. That's a nice uh, way to think about it. All right, so if it is full row rank, um, that means this matrix would also have full row rank. Why? Well, because it is the same, it is just the same matrix stacked twice, plus this added on the off diagonal block. So if two full row rank matrices are stacked like this, diagonal, that will means that the result would also be full row rank. So already something nice, already something nice. Yeah. So in fact, uh, this matrix inherits a lot from, from this matrix, right? Because uh, diagonal blocks are just a repetition. But it is not exactly the same, right? Uh, you know, this guy still exists. So we need to be careful, we need to be careful. Sometimes I see temptations of, uh, for people to just think about this and ignore this. But, is a bad temptation. <laughs> it exists, but it is not good. So this guy plays a role, obviously. Uh, the temptation comes from the fact that G is very easy to compute. Uh, almost any software will compute G for you. But, but well, G dot is not so easy to compute. So his uh, temptation is like, let's ignore G dot. What can it possibly do? Right? Uh, I saw uh, people saying, Let's just pretend like it is zero. <laughs> that is uh, one of the things uh, you hear. So uh, better better to stay away from temptations like this. Okay. All right. All right. So now what we have is our final model. This is the model that we obtain. Let's look at it carefully. So this x dot equals to matrix times x plus matrix times u, okay? And constraint times x dot. This is an implicit model. It is not explicit. We don't have reaction forces. Like reaction forces should be here, right? F times lambda, but we don't have them. But equation itself, since it is a linear model, it uh, describes well the original dynamics which is a constraint equation, right? So the, uh, this linear model would behave in the vicinity very closely to the original system. So it would behave like a constraint system. So it is an implicit model, basically. Constraints are still here, they're just here implicitly. So in fact, this will be obeyed without reaction forces to enforce them. Well, this is an uh, interesting fact about linearization, which is uh, just unique to constrained systems. After linearization, you get implicit model. You don't get explicit model, okay? Right. Uh, this is a potential source of errors, basically. Like if you, uh, if, for example, you take, instead of linearizing this, you take um, manipulate equations in the like native form, like 
h times q double dot plus c q dot plus g equal to t u uh, minus f lambda. Okay. Or minus g in this case, g lambda. g transpose lambda. And then you say, okay, we'll linearize this with respect to q, q dot, and lambda. And then we get this equation, right? Well, the result is not going to be the correct, uh, uh, correct system because uh, while linearizing with respect to lambda is perfectly fine, uh, the result of subsequent linear fraction summation is not going to give you uh, the same uh, same as uh, same system as the stale expansion would have given because during tail expansion you were linearizing this whole mess like this whole mess was linearized during tail expansion. Whereas if you uh, try to reduce this uh, by simply taking Jacobians with respect to lambda and etc., uh, you don't have a resource to recover this whole uh, linearization of this thing. So is the source of error. If you try to linearize system with respect to reaction forces, and then expect that after L of T, linear fashion summation, you would uh, recover a uh, model which would be correct, like best linear approximation. You would recover a linear approximation, okay? So uh, remember what I said, right? There are many linear approximations. So you would recover a linear approximation. You would just not recover the best linear approximation, okay? Uh, often enough, what you would recover would not even be controllable and, uh, and so on. So, okay, so this is what it is. Okay. This is our, uh, our implicit models that we get. Do we have any questions? Like this is half the lecture. After that, we'll go to control. Okay, no question. Now, now we go to see uh, one of my favorite methods in uh, this course. It's going to allow us to do stabilizing control on the systems. This is a method based on what we call orthogonal decompositions. Okay, so let's uh, start. So this constraint matrix G, remember, remember what it is, G is uh, this matrix, right? This is your G matrix. In case you, just to refresh, G times X dot equal to zero, this guy, right? So, is this matrix. Okay. So, this constraint matrix G, we can find its null space N, and it's a row space R. In fact, what we can find is orthogonal, orthonormal basis in those spaces, okay? Orthonormal means orthogonal first. So for a matrix to be orthogonal means its columns are orthogonal to each other. So the dot product with each other will be zero. Orthonormal means that they are also length one. So length of each column is one. Okay. Typical example of orthonormal matrix is a rotation matrix. Okay. Uh, so we can find orthonormal basis N and R. Okay. Uh, N will be orthonormal basis in the null space of G. So remember, uh, null space of G is uh, where x dot leaves. Why? Because we have g x dot equal to zero. So x dot lives in the null space of G. Okay. And R is a row space of this matrix where x dot has to be equal to zero. Right. So we write it this way. N equal to null of G. R equal uh, row of G. 
role and null space are orthogonal complement of each other. It means that the whole Rn space is uh, spun by sum, direct sum, what we call, of null space of G and row space of G. I think that's like called fundamental uh, theorem of linear algebra, something like this. But basically, it's like we have uh, two, those two orthogonal spaces. Any vector can be represented as a sum of two vectors, one line in the null space, one line in the row space. Okay, Any vector at all. Like it's not a, some vectors that are represented like this. Any vector is represented like this. Are the sum of those two components? Okay. Um, yeah. So matrices N and R are orthogonal components of each other. So N and R matrix, if we com combine them together, is a full rank matrix. Always like this. It's always like this. In fact, it's not only full rank, it is also orthonormal and pro pro provides orthonormal basis for Rn. And, the, and it is a rotation matrix. So it's like uh, there are so many properties of those things. If uh, you feel like, the, you know, there's like the math goes fast, you like all oh, so many properties and uh, I don't remember them. I recommend a refresher on fundamental subspaces and SVD because this is just a wealth of knowledge you would not regret. It. Okay, uh, so and and R together provide the full rank matrix. Okay. Now we define two new variables Z and Zeta. Zeta, that's a Greek letter. And they have the following relation to x. So z and zeta, if stacked together and multiplied by this uh, four rank matrix, will produce x. Okay. So in other words, this is the same as saying n z plus r zeta. Is equal to x. So x is equal to nz plus rz. Since this is full rank matrix, it is invertible. So uh, we can always uh, find z and z by inverting this matrix and multiplying by x. So this uh, this decomposition always exists. We can always replace x by this two variables because nr is a full rank matrix. Okay. So there, there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between pair of uh, z and zeta and x. So bo both of them are like, there is unique pairing. Any particular x would be compared to a particular pair x z and zeta. And any particular pair z and z will be compared to with one x. So it's one to one, not one to many, not many to one. It is one to one. In fact, you can recover, uh, you can recover z and z in this form. Okay. So z is equal to n transposed x, and z is equal to r transposed x. Why? Well, because uh, as I said, you can invert it, but in inverse of an orthonormal matrix is a transpose because it's a rotation matrix, right? So inverse of, uh, especially for full rank, it is just like analytic inverse of uh, e, this full rank matrix is just transpose of this matrix. So in transpose will be like n transpose, r transpose times x, that's what you get, right? Um, for not full rank matrices, like and and R individually are not full rank. Uh, for them, you can uh, say that the pseudo inverse is equal to the transpose. Okay. So for the full rank matrix, analytical inverse is uh, equal to transpose. For not full rank matrix, pseudo inverse is equal to transpose. Okay. All right. All right. So this is how we can recover Z and Z. Z is equal to n transpose x, Z is equal to r transpose x. 
Okay. Now, we know that uh, gx dot is equal to zero. gx dot is equal to zero. From this, it follows that x dot lies in the null space of g. Therefore, therefore, this guy R transpose x, which is zeta dot, right? Remember, uh, R transpose x is a recipe to get zeta. So R transpose x dot is a recipe to get zeta dot. Because R, uh, since G is a constant matrix, time derivative of, uh, you know, of zeta would be just R transpose x dot. Because this would, is just a constant. Okay. So this is equal to zero. Why is it equal to zero? Well, uh, because n lies in the null space of G, so it has no projection onto the row space of G, and R transpose, uh, right? So it, it lies in the null space, so X itself is a vector from the null space. But we said that null space and row space are orthogonal complements, so they have, um, uh, you, uh, if one multiplied by another, you would always get zero. So this would have to be zero. There are many ways to say the same thing. Like we can say any vector in null space has a zero projection on the row space, right? Or you can say this is just a test. Uh, yeah, okay, so there are many ways I will not uh, go on and on, but uh, yeah, this is uh, just is going, what is going to happen here. But this implies, this implies that n transpose x is equal to z dot. Uh, of course, this uh, implies that because again, we just take a derivative of n transpose x equal to z, and it will be n transpose x dot equals to z dot, right? Because n is constant. But now we can combine it. We can write this guy. And what we have is this so far is just a derivative of what we had on the previous slide. But since, see, because of this, we have here only one component, okay? Like, basically, this component here goes away because uh, it is zero. So while for x, for x, uh, here we'll have like nz plus r zeta, but for x dot we have only one component, nz dot. And this makes perfect sense. This is a coordinate in the null space of G. And our entire system uh, moves in the null space of G. So of course, uh, derivatives would have to have only those coordinates, right? Like no one to told us that the state cannot have coordinates in the null space of G. State can, but it cannot move. Like uh, this guys, like this guy here would have to remain static um, because of the constraint. But uh, yeah, its derivative has to be zero. Uh, uh, so x dot again lies in the null space of G, or you can say colon space of M if you want. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't write it here explicitly, but uh, this means that zeta. Let me zeta. It's equal to constant. Uh, is constant. Z is constant. No. Because of this. So there, uh, while Z, uh, coordinate Z is not constant. Z evolves with time. Zeta is constant. So Z is a state variable 
which is constant, is a constant state variable. Yeah. Okay, good. Now we can multiply our equation here by n transpose. Why? Well, uh, this is like a projection into the null space. Okay. Uh, and this is perfectly legit because n transpose is full row uh, rank, right? This full row rank. n is full column rank, and transpose is full row rank. So the resulting equations will be uh, linearly independent. Okay. All right. The resulting equations will be linearly independent. We may lose something by transposing uh, doing this, but we cannot like add more stuff. Okay. And uh, in fact, we are not going to lose anything. Uh, but that is a separate issue. Uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess it's quite quite easy to prove that we will not lose anything, because when we multiply, okay, so we multiply. What we have here is uh, z dot, right? This is z dot. If we assume that there is some component of x which we lost, we would have to assume that uh, this component of x is r z dot, right? Because x dot can be only represented as n z dot plus r z dot. But r z dot is zero by definition, right? because uh, you know x lies in the, in the null space of G. So this contains this guy contains the whole information about x. We did not lose anything by multiplying. So that means the right hand side is also contains everything. So we didn't lose anything by this multiplication. Okay, so multiplication here. Right? Okay. Now uh we remember that x is nz plus rz. We also remember that uh, n x dot is z dot. So from this, we get z here. Okay. Now, this, uh, this fact here, we use to produce this nz rz. Okay. So this comes from here. So now what we have is z, uh, z dot is equal to n transpose ac n z plus n transpose ac r z plus n transpose bc. So one more time, where, where does it come from? Um, there was this original multiplication by n transpose here. Okay. This is where this guy came from. Then there was a substitution here. This is where this n come from. And here, this is where this r come from. That's it. Okay. It's not so difficult. Okay. Now we can uh, define this matrix as a sub n. And we can define this matrix as n sub r, okay? And we can finally define this matrix as b sub n. Then what we have is z dot is equal to a sub n z plus a sub r z plus b sub n v. Notice, we are back to what looks like uh, LTI. Uh, same like it's the story of our life. We just always get back to uh, what looks like LTI. But, but this time, there is something magical about it. Whereas previously, we were talking about how x couldn't actually assume any value. There were values of x which it couldn't assume. 
uh, in fact, the values of x which lie in the row space of g. Here, z can assume any value. That is not limited by any. So this equation here is controllable. That is the difference. This expression, 21, is controllable. So uh, there is no, it doesn't lie in some null space or something. It just lies in Rk, whatever, uh, dimension of z. And that's controllable. So we, we don't have to worry about the fact that uh, LQR will fail, or placement will fail, controllability will fail. No, it is controllable. I mean, as long as B is correct, right? It depends on B and A, if it is controllable or not. But it can be. Previous can, couldn't be controllable. This is controllable. This, this can be controllable. Okay. Okay. So uh, the advantage here is that we expelled all variables which were static. So variables which could not be controlled. In fact, here they are. This is all static variables. They are neatly separated. And this vector is a constant. So this is a constant. Okay. It's just additive, you could say additive constant. Okay. It doesn't uh, do anything for stability. Okay. Now we could pause LQR, for example. But uh, if the control chain. So given this equation, we can find stabilizing control. Since this guy is constant, uh, we don't have to do anything about it. It does not change anything about stability. So it is fine for us to consider stabilizing control of this equation. Uh, remember, there is a difference between stabilizing control and control that drives the system to towards zero. Uh, stabilizing, uh, yeah, because uh, with, with stabilizing control, what you could do is like do a change of variables and make sure that this new variable is being driven to zero. Uh, strictly speaking, Lepunov, uh, stability requires uh, the state to approach zero, right? Uh, but we usually, uh, by this approach to zero, understand like an error of some kind. That is why we could ignore this uh, part, right? Like we could ignore it because we would introduce new variable or something where we would uh, get rid of this uh, extra part, right? Uh, that's if we're discussing Lipunov stability. But uh, ultimately, uh, stability does not depend, if you remember, stability depends on uh, state matrix, right? Have been Hurwitz. It does not depend on like additional vectors. What additional vector will do is just define where the steady state solution will be. So A sub R zeta defines steady state solution. It does not define anything about stability. So we ignore it rightly. It's not that we are being lazy, it doesn't matter for stability. It matters for where, where solution will land. Okay, so different, two different problems. Where solution will land is in fact closer to inverse dynamics question, whereas stability is stability. Okay, okay. So we have this equation. How do we stabilize it? Well, we propose linear control law u equal to minus kz, we substitute it into here instead of u. And what we get is a closed loop solution, right? A n minus b n k z. And by the way, here I think we substituted directly into this equation. So we still kept our a sub r z. No problem. I mean, like, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. 
So we have uh, z dot equals to a n minus b n k z times a sub r z. So as long as this matrix here is Hurwitz, the system is stable. That's it. Let's try to see how we can do and make it Hurwitz. Obviously, I realize we are almost out of time, but I will be quick with the last uh, two slides. Well, let's pause the couple. So we have this system. And here, notice I uh, ignore constant part. Okay. We introduce a quadratic cost. Quadratic cost. Where this is the cost with respect to the state, this is the cost with respect to control. For this system, optimal control law will be this guy. So this is the optimal gain. R inverse B transpose C S. Sorry. This is the optimal control. Okay. Where R is, so just a reminder, R is the same R. B is the same B. And this S here is a solution to uh one, one second. One second. Sorry, I have to pause. Okay. Uh, this S is the Ricard equation, right? This S is the Ricard equation. Solution to the Ricard equation. So, uh, just a reminder: what is the solution? To, what is the Ricard equation? Uh, Ricard equation, algebraic Ricard equation, is this guy. Uh, this quadratic equation with respect to S. Where did we get it from? Well, we get it from. Um, Hamiltonian Jacobi Bellman equation. If you write it out, Hamilton, there is a optimality principle, like Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation has to be satisfied. If you write it out, substitute there uh, the cost, uh, what you would uh, and uh, take into account the fact that the optimal cost to go is a quadratic with the S as the um, matrix of the classic form, what after simplifications, like taking partial derivatives with respect to u and x, you get uh, this Riccati equation and this optimal gain. So if uh, any of this sounds not familiar, uh, you can read up on LQR. I have a lecture on LQR, so you could uh, review it if you want. I can send it uh, using you know, some of the slides. So, uh, you know, standard stuff. All of this is the same as for systems without constraints. Uh, the only sim thing that is different is that uh, here we have B n a n. So you need to remember that those are for the explicit system with implicit constraints, which is uh, being subjected to orthogonal decomposition. So a n is a state matrix which is multiplied by n on both sides. So it was orthogonally decomposed. Basically, we took, uh, you can say, like a quarter of this matrix, right? You could say. Okay. Uh, after solving this equation, which you can solve by calling LQR in MATLAB or uh, algebraic Riccati in Python, uh, you would get uh, this control gain. That's it. So it's quite easy. It's not very difficult. You can also solve this equation using SVD, SDP, if you remember the semi-definite programming. So this this equation here, uh, using sure complement, you can decompose it into a SDP form as an LMI, and it would be easily solved as an LMI. Okay. So all of this is not very complicated. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a difficult stuff. But, uh, if you need a reminder of what how to work with Lomais again, I can send you like the slides and stuff. All right. All right. Now, uh, here is uh, like user uh, way of looking at it. You want LQR controller? 
just call LQR in MATLAB or Python. I mean, in Python, again, there's algebraic recursive, it's called, but same, same thing, right? Uh, and you call it, giving it A N, B N, Q, and R as inputs, okay? You want to do a poll placement, you get K you, by calling place and providing it with, uh, again, a, N, B, N, and poles. Now, what, what is important? I, I already said that uh, it is important that you use here A, N, and B, N, not A, C, and B, C, so not uh, the closed loop, uh, sorry, not the implicit uh, LTI, but orthogonal decomposition LTI. So LTI after you are uh, did orthogonal decomposition. Uh, important detail, because if you put A, C, B, C here, you will get... Uh, Erkat's equation could be solved. Okay, second important part. Uh, not just cost function. Cost function is with respect to Z and U. U is fine. You, you don't have any problem with U. U is fine. But Z is not X, right? It's a different uh, variable. So you have to remember that if you want the cost with respect to X, uh, your uh, you could write it, you could write it, right? Uh, X is um, like Z is the number N transpose X, right? So your cost, the same cost with respect to X would look like X transposed N U N transposed X. So you would have this D different matrix, like instead of this matrix, you would have this matrix, N, Q, and transposed. So the if, if it is important for you, like particular cost that you def define, which I find for like 99 cases, people don't care about this. They just use uh, Q and R as basically knobs to turn to get a performance they want. But if you actually care about your cost, which sometimes is the case, especially for like modern stuff like ILQR, DDP. Uh, well, you have to remember that uh, the variables are different. So you have to, trans like if you want cost in X, you have to remember that the cost in X would look like this. Okay, That's another important issue. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's uh, pretty much it. Uh, as you can see, as soon as you are able to go to this system, everything becomes simple. It is linear control. A linear control with linear control law. Uh, you know, LQR is the same as in a linear control class. Uh, you can do it by one line of code. So everything is very, very simple. Uh, description of this method can be found in this paper, which is available on uh, archive. Okay. Archive, okay. Uh, right. You can find it here. And I recommend the reading. It is quite simple. Like if you're going to skip like introduction, literature review and everything like that, this paper will be like half a page. So it is very, very easy read. I recommend, very nice. Uh, this is roughly speaking the same, the same stuff, but it is more difficult to find. Uh, there is no archive, uh, you know, I, I, but the PDF is not can be found through Google, uh, and uh, this is you notice uh, 2014, this is 2016. So this is basic updated version of the same paper. But uh, yeah, uh, both are fine. Both are fine. They will describe the same stuff. Uh, I, I I just list both because this is like two papers that. Uh, uh, basically introduced this uh, decomposition. Yeah. Right. So uh, I recommend uh, to read this, this foundational paper for this uh, particular stuff. Okay, so with that, we finished this lecture. Next week, we are going to look at the observers. So today controllers, right? But you remember control is only part of what we need. We also need observation because, you know, 
if we don't know the state of the system, we cannot do u equals to kx. Well, we need to know x for that. And x is uh, not always measured directly. So we, in fact, need uh, an observer. Next week, observers. And after that, we will go towards friction and other more complicated stuff about contact. Right. Uh, any questions? Okay, no questions, then uh, I will see you next week. And don't forget to, uh, you have a practice, practice session today with Anastasia. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you,